Hello and welcome to another episode of how to build a compiler with LLVM and MLIR. Today's episode is a bit different than uh, previous episodes because in today's episode I'm not going to show you any code. We, we're going to talk about just an overview of MLIR and the basics that we, uh, we need to continue working on the Serene compiler. Uh, before we uh, start on the topic, I need to mention a few changes that I made to the compiler. Actually, I'm still working on them. Um, in the previous episode, I mentioned that I'm working on the just-in-time compiler, and that work kind of pushed me toward adding a source manager to, uh, to the compiler. Source manager is a concept that we're going to talk about in future episodes, uh, but basically adding a source manager for us uh, kind of uh, forced us to uh, make changes to the reader process as well so the reader is um, now different the logic is the same but it has to uh, be able to work with the source manager and with with these new changes i had to make a change to the serene c itself and the cli interface of Serene C is now completely different. So whatever we talked about in the previous episode and especially like I'm going to talk about the uh, old interface today as well. So all of them are going to change in the near future, but I'm going to have another episode describing the changes and everything. So this is just for you. If you, if you look at the master branch today, you see different uh, code than uh, other branches like other episode branches and that's totally okay i'm going to have another episode about uh, these new changes and uh, a disclaimer uh, today uh, obviously we're going to talk about mlir but i'm not an expert in mlir i'm just a user so um i'm trying to keep today's episode like a high level overview as a high level overview but I already included some of the some talks and some resources about MLIR by MLIR uh, developers. So I highly recommend to watch them and read them to have better understanding of MLIR. Um, moving forward, first of all, let's talk about why we want to use MLIR. I already talked about uh, talked about this in the first or second episode. I can't remember, but a brief uh, history of what happened and why uh, I chose to use MLIR. So long ago, I I had to um, find a right platform for uh, the for my new language. So. Uh, I did some experiments on like different platforms like the JVM. I, I looked at different host languages like uh, Rust, Golang, and some other stuff like Java. And finally, I came to the conclusion that LLVME is the best platform that uh, like the best choice I have. So I read a, uh, uh, read a lot about LLVM. I kind of talked to many people. I ask for uh, different opinions in different uh, communities, and overall, the my under like overall my understanding was LLVM is the best thing that uh, I can use. It, it it's just a set of libraries to create a compiler to create a language, and that's that's really uh, what I'm looking for. So I tried to use LLVM with different languages because. Uh, to be honest, I'm not comfortable with uh, C++. I don't like the language that much. It, it, it's an awkward language, but whatever. That's my own uh, opinion and skill set. So I, I use other languages like Rust and Golang, as I mentioned, but I didn't have um, a good experience with the C API of the LLVM. Uh, somebody already uh, mentioned to me that there's something called MLIR, which is really cool. You have to uh, have like take a look at it um, and use it. So some people already uh, suggested MLIR to me, but uh, 
my when I uh, when I looked at MLIR initially, and I read on the website that it's part of the LLVM, I thought, okay, I have to learn LLVM first to uh, be able to use LL, uh, MLIR. Sorry, but that wasn't the case. And so, if you don't know uh, LLVM that much, it's okay. You can start by using MLIR. It's not necessary to know. Uh, about LLVM, especially LLVM IR. If you knew already, perfect, you're in advantage. But if you don't, that's totally okay. And obviously, when we move forward, we're going to learn uh, the whole MLIR and LLVM library together. So if you don't know LLVM, no big deal. We can start by MLIR. And when I looked at MLIR and like try to understand it and like work around it, uh, work, work around uh, with it a little bit, uh, it was clear to me that, okay, MLIR is really good and it's that good that I can abandon any effort I had on like with other languages and just stick to C++ and MLIR. And that's uh, where we are today. But uh, why MLIR is actually beneficial for us? Why it's that like so good? So if we put MLIR uh, aside for a moment and just focus on LLVM, in order to use LLVM, as uh, I mentioned in earlier episodes, we need to create like we need to create a front end that reads the source code of whatever language we're working on and create and translate that source code into LLVM IR. And then feed that LLVM IR to the uh, compiler backend, and then the backend will will take care of code generation and stuff like that for us. But here, um, like this design is actually really good in compared to other uh, libraries that might be uh, out there. But there's a, like a big issue here. LLVM IR is too low level so you can think of llvm ir as it might not be a right uh, it might not be a, like a correct example but you can think of llvm ir as assembly instructions so llvm ir it uh, on its own has a set of instructions that you can compare them to assembly instructions so if you if we don't want to use llvm ir we had to come up with some form of IR on, uh, for our own and then uh, translate that IR to assembly, actually, to assembly instructions. And that's what the backend, uh, the backend of LLVM uh, does for us. So, and it's kind of limited, like LLVM IR is to some sense really similar to assembly. So it's, it's kind of, uh, it's really limited. So, when uh, when I wanted to like do some uh, experiment on LLVM IR and write some basic uh, some basic I don't know languages with LLVM IR, uh, I had a tough time because it's really hard to kind of model a high level concept into LLVM IR, which is like really low level. And really soon I was like, okay, I need to. Uh, break down the problem like this is a, like a really hard problem I have to break it down into a smaller problems and like easier problems to, to solve like create abstractions basically on top of LLVM IR and I was trying to call like uh, I already uh, recommended two books in this series one is like the dragon book of compiler the other one is the tiger book they're uh, kind of well known so in those com in those books, if you read them already, you'll know that uh, all the steps that I'm talking about are kind of common in all the compilers. So I wanted to create a, like a high level abstractions uh, uh, abstraction layer on top of uh, the LLVM IR to kind of solve a problem that is really hard, like basically mapping a really high level concept to a low level concept is really tough. So when I tried to come up with that abstraction, that was around the time that I learned about MLIR. And basically to put it like as simple as possible, 
MLIR is actually a framework to build a compiler with our own IR. So basically, it helps me to create the abstraction that I need on top of LLVM IR so I can break down the problem into a smaller uh, problems and like well-designed abstractions. The name of ML, like I, to be honest, I still uh, don't know exactly what ML stands for in MLA, MLIR. Like the, I saw a talk uh, from LLVM developers. They made a joke around it as well. But the best uh, definition I like I heard is multi-layer or multi-level IR. That is really like nice. So. When we create abstraction, like mathematically speaking, abstractions come in uh, different layers. So we create an abstraction on top of a, like a problem we have to make it simpler, like to, to be able to understand the problem at hand, like uh, better. And then we create another layer of abstraction on top of the previous one to help us see the bigger picture. And like we create these layers of abstraction on top of each other to get to a point that the problem is simple enough that we can reason about it and uh, break it down into uh, smaller pieces and shuffle things around and come up with a solution, right? And that's what exactly MLIR, MLIR is doing for us. So many other people uh, that uses MLIR uh, in different companies or individuals or whatever, they came up with their own layers in M M MLIR. I'm keeping, I keep saying layers or levels because there's a term for uh, layers or levels in MLIR. We call it like MLIR call them dialects. So from now, now on, whenever I, whenever I say dialect it means those layers on top of each other so people actually came up with different dialects they created their own dialect to do some specific things uh, or general things they came up with those abstractions so and some of them are open sourced and as as far as i know like i i watched a talk about mehdi i mean by mehdi amini he was saying that uh at that time google has like 60 different dialects and most of them are not open source so uh when people create these dialects some uh, and open source them as a compiler programmer i can actually use those dialects in my uh, advantage advantage i can uh, leverage other people's work and create my own dialect the my dialect would be kind of a model of concepts around my own language and use other people's dialect to kind of fill the gaps and create the entire um, compiler uh, we're going to have a look at it like uh, in a few minutes but llvm uh, sorry mlir itself uh, works around a language so it has it's kind of have a language on its own that describes the different dialects uh let's have a uh, quick look at what that language is and how it works so first of all that language is ssa based what is an ssa i included a link to a wikipedia article describing what ssa is but for short ssa or static single assignments is a concept in intermediate languages that uh, based on like whenever an intermediate uh, representation or whenever an IR is based on SSA, it means that variables in that IR has to be defined before uh, initialization and they we can assign one variable only once and it doesn't change ever again. We can't reassign it, right? So um in terms of llvm ir and assembly we can think of uh, ssa values as kind of registers but in mlir since it's really high level we can think of ssa values as 
variables. I, I don't like the name of name variable here because basically they don't change. They are not variables. Uh, but think of them as bindings. We have a name for a value. That's it. And it never changes. We can't reassign it. Uh, the MLIR language itself is typed. But the good thing and the thing that I really liked about MLIR is that the typed uh, the types of MLIR are not hard coded. So unlike LLVMIR, which uh, you have a set of types to use and you have to kind of model your own types around them. Um, sorry, in MLIR uh, types are kind of a basic block in the entire system. We can uh, create our own types and uh, come up with a different types, uh, like a different type systems based on the API that MLIR provides for us. And we can use them to create our own types. And finally, the language itself is context-free. Um, it's a weird, term context-free uh, for lack of better words i chose to call it context-free but what it means is the mlir language itself is just a bunch of text if you uh, there's a tool called uh, i now just i remember uh, about it so there's a tool called mlir opt that you can use it to kind of interact with M mlir i wish i could actually included include this one uh, in the talk but hopefully for the next episode i prepare some stuff to talk about M uh, mlir up so you can actually pass some a start like a start a file sorry create a file write bunch of uh, mlir in it and pass it to ML mlir opt and like interact with it as far as mlir concerned that's as long as the syntax is valid, it's okay. MLIR doesn't know what that uh, what, uh, what that code that you wrote does, but um, it can verify the syntax. And if there's a, like a dialect that MLIR already knows about it, it can do some stuff for you. But when you create your own dialect, uh, MLIR doesn't know about what it does necessarily, right? That's what I meant by context-free. Um, as, as I already mentioned, uh, the layers of abstraction in MLIR are called dialects. So each dialect is a collection of operations. I'm going to talk about uh, operations next. Uh, a bunch of custom types, some metadata, and we can use different dialects uh, together to like solve a problem or something to that sort. One thing that uh, I have to mention here is that if we take a look at the other programming languages that uses LLVM or LLVM already, all of them actually had the same problem. They tried to come like um, translate their source code into LLVM IR and pass it to the backend, but they, they needed to do some, uh, they need to process the input, uh, like the source code and analyze it and make some changes and be smart about the different type of uh, optimization they want to do on, the, on their source code. And the, you can't do that on LLVM IR that much because it's really low level. So they had to come up with their own abstraction layers. And basically all of them had to create their own IR as I, I, I mentioned earlier. But MLIR is kind of tr like, is an e effort to actually unify all of them under, uh, under the same umbrella and like with, with the same API and set of rules. So, for example, uh, I'm not sure about this. I, I don't know how Rust, for example, implements uh, their other la layer of IR. But if someday they move to MLIR, I can use their uh, dialects in Serene as well 
and do some stuff with their dialect or for example <coughs> excuse me uh i might butcher the name but there's a like a fortran compiler in llvm called flang i guess i don't know how how it pronounced flang maybe uh flang itself uses a llvm ir uh, sorry mlir so right now i can actually use flang's dialect in my own compiler use the things that flying people already implemented in their dialects in my own compiler and that and that's totally okay i can mix and match all the um, oops what happened i can mix and match all the uh dialects together to get what i want from uh, uh different layer of abstractions some of the basic uh, dialects that uh, MLIR already provides are like std uh, dialect, LLVM dialect, math dialects, async dialects. Actually, um, let's have a look at the different dialects there. Okay. Oh, actually, let me turn off my dark mode. Okay. So... All of these uh, dialects are uh, there for us to use. I don't know, like the built-in dialect is like what you get out of the box and it's quite limited. It doesn't have much to offer. Actually, th that's a wrong statement. It doesn't provide anything more than it should. So it's quite, it has quite reasonable amount of uh, functionality and that's totally fine. Uh, beside the built-in dialect, the STD one is kind of important. It provides like different operations to do like to call a function. I don't know, to compare some stuff, to create conditionals. Or um, SCF is kind of interesting. We can create a parallel execution, reduce, if, for, yield, while, you know, it, when we want to use the like if i use the sf scf dialect today i don't have to make any of these anymore so like to create a, like a conditional i have like scf if i can use it actually i don't know how it works at the moment i have to read the docs obviously but i mean it's really nice uh to use other dialects like it it solves many problems and as a programmer i don't have to do much you know, uh, my problems, like I can focus on what matters to me and to my language, to my compiler, or for example, the async dialect, like it is actually really amazing. Uh, we can take, like, we can leverage these operations to create our own, uh, async infrastructure for our compiler and don't do like, don't be like, we, we can skip all this. There's nothing to be worried about. Like I, I'm as a programmer who works on this compiler alone most of the time. This makes me really happy. Like this is actually one of the best things I like about ML, MLIR. It's just amazing. So let's skip all that and uh, stay on track. Very okay. So. Now, operations. What are operations? So, the name might be a little bit, a little bit confusing, but operation is a concept, is a, like a unit of abstraction in MLIR. So, dialects is a collection of, uh, dialect is a co collection of operations. Each operation is an abstract, uh, like an abstract con uh, concept. It's not an inst instruction. It's not an instruction. Uh, unlike LLVMIR that has its own set of instructions. It uses SSA form. So operations usually uh, return something in type of uh, like as an SSA. We can write our uh, operations to uh, fully in C++ or we can use table gen. There's a backend for it to 
define our operations and table gen will generate everything for us including the c plus plus implementation and most of the things that we need we might need to add few things to like to make it work but it's a huge advantage to do it i'm going to show you show show you how it works in a in a bit and finally since uh as i mentioned the dialog is just a bunch of text so just a text format right uh kind of a uh i don't know what to call it but um kind of an example that M mlir uh, engineers uh used in their talks is that they don't want the they didn't want the mlir to be the json of compilers as you know json is just a like a format that there's no constraint there no there's no types and things like that so everything is in a string format you can pretty much do whatever you want it might sound cool but actually it's not because uh, then you have to deal with the verification validation of the data and things like that on your own instead of uh, the format like the format doesn't provide anything for you if you are a closure fan you know that there's a like a uh, alternative for uh, format like edn that solve these problems or protobuf or avro or stuff like that they try to fix J uh, like formatting issue that J json have with like different types to be more strict things like that and mlir engineers didn't want the uh, mlir dialects to be like json as well so operations have different um kind of i don't know let's call them behaviors operations might have their own verifiers and printers by default they don't there's a, like a built-in one that uh, mlir will use but we can provide a custom verifier or printer that actually works as a like a ser serializer and deserializer for our operation so basically whenever we want to read the operation from uh, an mlir file or some other sources we can verify verify the structure of that operation and make sure that that operation is in a form that we want and semantically is correct and the printer obviously uh, serializes that operation into a, like a text format uh, that i'm going to show you there's another concept called attributes uh, in mlir that kind of confused me to begin with i'm going to show you how it, like what it is uh, and how it looks like uh, in a bit but this is new uh, to MLIR. I, I couldn't find anything like that in LLVM IR. If you know uh, about attributes and if attributes exist in LLVM IR, I don't know. Please let me know. Uh, I'm going to show it to you. It's better to talk about it on an example. Also, blocks and regions. So, blocks are everywhere. LLVM IR has blocks as well. Even like if we don't talk about LLVM at all, blocks are kind of uh, basic. I want to say blocks but basic concepts in compilers a block of code actually excuse me you know you might hear the uh, the word block and think okay it's like a block of code in java or c plus plus or stuff like that but whenever we talk about blocks in compiler world block is actually a straight line of instructions that there's no branch in them so there's no branching in a block when you enter a block you, there's like a list of instructions you have to execute and till till the end of the block when when you want to exit the block right in terms of compilers whenever we want to like translate the ir code in and generate the machine code from it or target code from it we try to create blocks of code and kind of uh, link them together. It would be like jump from this block to that block. If you already know about assembly, you, 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 you'll get it like in no time. But blocks are, think of it as a, like a straight line of instructions with no interruptions in between. By interruption, I mean like no branch in between. So when you enter 
you start executing the instructions till you exit the block. But region is something uh, actually uh, only MLIR has and LLVMIR doesn't have regions. Regions are a list of or uh, an ordered ordered list of blocks. So each region might have one or more blocks ordered in a certain way. We can both nest blocks and regions inside each other. So regions, it's a, like a, 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 what I'm going to say is not 100% accurate, but you can think of uh, regions as blocks in different programming la languages like Java and C++. I'm going to show you examples and that would makes it easier to understand. And finally, types. Uh, I mentioned it or, uh, already. Uh, LLVM types are, uh, we can create our own custom types uh, on MLIR dialects and that's a huge advantage. Uh, another concept that we need to know to continue working on the Serene compiler is the pass infrastructure. Pass infrastructure is something that uh, LLVM has actually, not MLIR. It's not uh, new to ML, uh, MLIR. Uh, so in the LLVM, by the way, we're going to have another episode about LLVM, uh, another episode like this about LLVM as well, when we get to the point that uh, we need to talk about LLVM specifically. We're going to have another episode about it. But for now, I, I decided to uh, exclude LLVM talks for now. But LLVM itself and MLIR both uh, provide something called pass infrastructure. Basically, what it does is we, we come up with an IR, either LLVM IR or MLIR or whatever. And then we create some stuff called passes. So each pass, uh, basically we run different passes on our IR and each pass does something special. For example, we might fold constant values in a path. Uh, we, we might have a pass which actually, uh, I don't know, analyze the code and decide to remove some of the IR based on some uh, conditions and things like that. And the infrastructure part of it are the API and things around the uh, pass management. It's pretty neat. And in MLIR, pass, uh, the pass manager is multi-threaded. I don't know about LLVM, but I guess it's not multi-threaded in LLVM since the engineers uh, kind of uh, try to make a big deal out of it. And actually it is a big deal, but I mean, it, LLVM probably doesn't have a multi-threaded pass management and that's why MLIR engineers were happy about it. So how it works is we create our IR and then we specify some passes that we want to process that IR for us. And after applying those passes at, on the IR, we end up with a new IR, like a processed IR that might be optimized, depends on the different passes that we applied on it. It's a different pass. So in previous episode, we saw, uh, I showed you how semantic analysis works in the string compiler. But in the future, in the near future, we're going to move most of the logic of semantic analysis into the pass infrastructure. So how it works, like, what I want to do is actually to have a one-on-one ma -on -one mapping from the AST nodes into SLIR operations. I'm going to show it to you uh, in a bit, but when we do that, then our first layer of abstraction would be exactly the same as the AST we have. And then we can use different passes to do some sort of analysis on it, type checking on it, and then pass it to the second layer to run some other passes, like lower them to other dialects and things like that. These passes can actually do uh, pattern rewriting. How it works is you can define your patterns and MLIR and LLVM both provide a pattern matcher. So the pattern that you write will 
be matched against some patterns in the IR, on the IR level. And then you, when your pattern matched to a certain uh, code, you can make decision on what to do with it. Either rewrite it to another uh, SSA form or uh, like a other, make some changes to the IR, remove it, add more stuff to it, or change, change it to another dialect, which in case of changing to another dialect, in MLIR um, terminology, it calls lowering to other IR. So for example, our first layer of IR is called SLIR. And what I do is actually to use the pass infrastructure to lower or to translate the, our SLIR to other dialects like STD dialects or SCF dialect that I showed you earlier. We can write these patterns uh, and like rewriting rules uh, with table gen as well, which is a big plus. Let's go to write, so that's perfect. And let's talk about the uh, operation definition and specification or ODS and basically how that uh, table gen, like how the table gen looks like. Da, da, da. Mm. What is this thing actually? Oh, whatever. Um, I'm going to show you something from MLIR itself. It's actually the table gen definition for toy ops, a toy, something, a new dialect, not a new dialect, a dialect called toy, which is for an example, like for the MLI, official MLIR uh, tutorial. This is how we use the table gen. As you can see, it's kind of similar to a scripting language like I don't know Python or some other stuff. Like uh, it's 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 quite simple. It's much simpler than C plus plus, right? Yeah, we include some of the definitions that we have in other places in other TD files, and then we create a dialect that inherits from dialect uh, class. This def actually creates a class. Then we give it a name, some C uh, C plus plus name and space. And then we, we can create uh, create a, like a base class for our uh, toy operations. Then we can define different operations that we have in that dialect, like constant op here, and the name that appear, will appear in the MLIR textual format would be constant. And then, excuse me, some uh, actually traits that defines the different aspect of that uh, that operation. A summary, a description, like it's really nice. You can actually document your operations here. And I, uh, uh, there must be some tools to generate the documentation out of uh, this description here. <clears throat> the arguments, the result and result type, if there's a, like a parse, a custom parser for it, uh, different builder methods. D by the way, don't worry if you don't, don't understand any of this. <clears throat> In the future episodes, when we, we want to work actually on the SLIR itself, I'm going to talk, uh, like talk, about, talk about these kind of concepts in details. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, <clears throat> what happened to my voice? <laughs> um, as you can see, it's much simpler to write uh, operations and different things that we might need for our dialect in this format rather than writing C++ code. And on the on build time, MLIR and table gen are table gen are smart enough to create the generate the C++, C++ code for us out of these definitions. Going back to our uh, slides, I can't call them a slides, but whatever. Let's see some examples. I'm using org mode as you might already know. If you want, if you uh, if you want to actually uh, see the or see this org file for yourself, just you have to have MLIR mode and LLVM mode installed on your Emacs. Both of them are uh, distributed uh, alongside LLVM and in in the LLVM table. So uh, just load them up and you're good to go. So let's see uh, the general syntax of uh, LLVM, uh, sorry, MLIR. I kind of uh, 
use the same uh, line of code from one of the talks that I put the link to it in the resources section. And uh, for, I hope it's okay. I change. I made some changes, uh, but I don't think uh, we're going to have like licensing issue. So let's just start by talking about this section. So as you can see, this thing, this line of code looks like an assignment. By the way, it's a, like a very long, a very long line of code, and I wrapped it into uh, three lines. So it it should be something like this, right? I I broke it down, but it's fine because like I just wanted to wanted it to be nicer. So the first part, this percentage sign uh, sign here, kind of. Uh, we use percentage sign to describe a local variable. So the result here is local to that scope. And the name result here is an SSA or a, like a read. It's an, yeah, actually it's an SSA that has two values. So unlike LLVMIR, MLIR operations can return multiple values, not just one. And here we have a, variable that I don't like to say variable, let's call them SSA form. We have an SSA form that has two values and the blah operation returns two values. The sum dialect, this part is the name of our uh, dialect, which is a uh, sum dialect. And after the dot is the operation ID or operation name. So right now, we're using an operation called blah. The blah operation has one input argument. By the way, as I, as I mentioned, the percentage sign is like, okay, use this variable or SSS form, SSA form here. And this part means I want to use the second, third, sorry, the third value of this SSA form, like probably, this SSA form is defined somewhere and it has more than three uh, values. So we want to use the third value uh, and pass it to operation blah as the input argument. Then we have a map of attributes. So we have attributes called sum.attribute and the value is true. Another one called sum attribute and the value is three. There's a like underline here to uh, demonstrate that we, we can differentiate them with different characters. That they're not the same. That's uh, obvious. And finally, after a colon, we have the input types. So since Blah already just accepts one input argument, and that input argument has to be in example type. The type of this thing here is example type, and this example type here is a custom type for some dialect. And we define types like this, like this explanation mark here is kind of a sign to define uh, types, to point to types, right? So our uh, some dialect must have an example type and that example type is the type of the input argument. So it's better like the, uh, the XSSA form, the third value of XSSA form has to be in this type. And after this uh, arrow, we define the output type of the current operation, like functions, you know, functions have like a result type, operation ha operations have result type as well. Don't compare them to functions, they're different operations. The name is confusing, but it's just a concept. We can call it whatever we want. We we are modeling uh, something that we have using operations. It doesn't mean an operation has to do something. It's just an, just a concept. So the result type of our operation, as as I uh, as we already mentioned, it has to return two values. The first value is in type S. Type S. Like the the name type here is irrelevant. We can like call it like, I don't know, blah. No, blah is not a good name. Like foo s for example. 
So the type of the first or, uh, first return type has to be foos of type dialect, and the second one has to be type C of the same dialect. We don't have to always stick to our custom types. We can, like for example, do I don't know I eight here. Nothing prevents us from doing that. I'm going to show you more example, but just for demonstrations. And finally, a location. Every operation in uh, MLIR can have a location. It's better to have a location. Actually, in the engineers, I, I remember that they stated that they have to have a location. But like, I didn't use a location in, in SLIR and it works just fine. But it's kind of pointless to not to have location. Like, it, it would be ridiculous. Anyway. The location uh, can be in different formats. For example, right now, for the blah operation, we actually used a call site location. So, in the actual source code of the uh, like that serene file, in line ten and column eight, in function main, we have we're calling something that that something kind of. Uh, translate into this blow operation right so that's something that we have it might be a like a function call or whatever but this like we can actually preserve the source location where we like where call this operation to be generated and whenever we have an issue or we want to report back to user in form of error or some other formats or a warning or whatever we can use this location and use that source manager that i mentioned earlier we're going to have another episode about that one we can use all these together to generate a report to user to the user let's have a look at uh, an, uh, look at another example <coughs> excuse me uh, this time about blocks and regions. So this is how we define functions in um, MLIR func that at sign symbol means like this is like a symbol, like a global symbol we can address to it uh, from other places in the same module. And uh, this function takes like two arguments. The first one should be an I64, the second one I1 and returns an I64. And here, this uh, curly brace is actually uh, is the start of a region. That's how region works in MLIR. Like as I mentioned, like blocks of code in like a regular languages like C plus plus or Java. And our region contains of several blocks. This is how we define a block, right? That caret sign with the name of the block, the arguments of the block, basically. You have to read about the blocks and regions, but how it works is you can kind of think of it as input to the blocks. If, for example, uh, like uh, we can pass values to a block as we do here, right? We call the block, we not call, we jump to block three, BB3, and we pass this input to that block, right? Um, like this SSA form comes from here, we pass it to block three, block three is here. So that SSA form there would be this C in here and then do some stuff. As you can see in block, actually I added this thing uh, later. Uh, now, I can, now I can see the issue here. This thing should not be here because, oops, because it's a branch. It, it already means like jump to that block and the operation there would be a, a like a waste so when we move to this block, I, if I rename this thing C, C here, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. So block number three already has a, like an operation that that operation has its own region and its own block. So we can nest 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 them as uh, as we as uh, uh, we like and. This way we can actually, it, it will like LLVMIR doesn't have any of this. It only has some blocks. If you know how, if, for example, if you want to model an if condition in LLVMIR, oh, it's a, it's hard. It's, it's actually for that level of abstraction, it's really good. But for a higher level of abstraction, we need 
better tools and this is the better tool so let's let's think of i don't know like a if a statement in a list right so if a statement no um not if a statement let's find a better let's have a micro a uh, macro right right let's have a macro call no 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 let's just stick with it so in in uh, in a list if works like this like we we have a condition and a then block and finally an else block so if you want to uh, use llvm ir to model this it, it would be like there's a way to do it and it's like a common way to do it but that if like the if condition that we have here is like a higher level condition like in a higher level language so it makes sense to you like in llvm ir with the blocks and regions like this one uh, this would be a, like a region this one would be a region and we can just pass these two region and we, we can have like an operation called if for example let's rename this to uh, i don't know to green dot if for example if op and then we can have two regions one for the then block and one for the else block each of them can have its own set of uh, operations and things like that and we can pass them around and then use the pass manager to optimize them and it's pretty neat actually okay um moving forward some real example uh, on uh, uh, using the serene compiler so we can use uh, the following uh, command line uh, to actually generate uh, this this source here this SL slir here just to show you i already did it so um let's change it to slir actually and generate as you can see i i already moved it to uh, to the other to the org file but uh oh by the way this is as i mentioned this interface is going to go away the new interface is different so uh i'm going to create a branch for this episode in this in this branch this behavior is preserved don't worry okay let's look at what we have here uh as you as you already know the module is the unit of compilation in both llvm ir and mlir so we have a unit of compilation called user and we, we the name is kind of optional but i chose to put it there the name of the module directly maps to the namespace concept that we have and i showed you earlier a module has a, like a region and in that region we can like do uh, whatever we want to compile like to actually our ir resides in the uh, module operation here actually let me show you the code that we generated from so this is the code that we have like a main function that returns a, like a function that anonymous function itself returns three another function called main, main one that has three parameters and returns three i randomly just wrote this with no purpose so this uh, that one translate to this slir so this is slir our first layer of abstraction our dialect name here is serene I might change it to another uh, to actually SLIR later on because right now we have just one layer. Uh, in the future we might have more, so it's better to uh, ha have like a sp explicit name for each part. On the first line, we have an operation called FN. The name is kind of obvious. We use this operation to define a function, but why didn't we use? Uh, the built-in function so the idea is as i mentioned we try to map our ast to operations in um, slir and then decide what to do with them and since it's the first layer of abstraction we just define a new operation that creates a function or define like describes a concept of function 
and in so like it has a region obviously uh we when we define this function we assign it to a ssa form zero if we don't so this thing called value in the api if we don't give it a name it comes like mlir fill out the name for us like this like incremental uh in integer values and inside the function we have a another operation called value that value has an attribute with the same name and integer zero as the value of value it's hard and the type is i64 this thing this zero here is hard coded in right now because as you already know Anna, as i mentioned uh, nearly in every episode we want to create the minimal working compiler at first we want to uh, finish up the wiring of the compiler so we have all the pieces in place it doesn't do much it, it like this code doesn't do anything but after we come up with that minimal compiler we have all the pieces ready for us to start working on the actual uh, language implementation so this thing is this zero here is hard coded and the, uh, we don't like the value operation doesn't have any input argument as you can see the type is empty and the actual uh, input argument is empty and finally it returns a, a, a i64 and i64 so that number two ssa form here must have an i64 value one thing that confused me a lot when i started mlir is what's the difference between input arguments and attributes so they kind of the name now that i know it the name is kind of obvious but back then i didn't know and it confused me so the attributes are compiled time so they're static right they had you have to pro like you can't pass them dynamically or at least i don't know a way to do it but input arguments are runtime so when we when actually yeah runtime is kind of a correct terminology we use some other operation to create some come up with some values and we can pass, pass them around as arguments to other operations like exactly like function arguments we can pass anything to a function argument at, at runtime and we can do the same for operation input arguments but attributes has to be static and their compile time and finally we return the ssa number two for our function uh, operation and then the same oh by the way uh we have an set of we have a map of attributes for the fn operation like the arguments there's no argument the name of that fn uh, function that is main the visibility of it that should be public these are things that i care about as the dialect author right each dialect might uh, have different operations and different set of attributes the second one is the same but for the main one uh, function as you can see it has three uh, input uh, three input arguments as you saw earlier in the file right three v y and n and all of them has to be i64 the i64 again is hard coded but we can use like inference later or we come up with a, a function signature definition syntax to get these it's not important right now let's just keep it and uh, stay on course and then when we come up with uh, sorry when we came up with the slir we can transform the slir or as i mentioned earlier lower it to other irs other dialects sorry we can do this do it by this command let me show you so not here sorry where is it so same command as before, but instead of emitting SLIR, we emit MLIR. The name is kind of confusing, right? Uh, I chose a MLIR. We, I might come up with a better name in the future, but to kind of to point the fact that this IR level contains everything that MLIR provides. No sign of SLIR in this one. 
So we I use the pass uh, pass manager and pass infrastructure of M MLIR to convert this SLIR for uh, um, code to the uh, to other dialects. In this case, STD dialect and the built-in dialect. Right. So remember this function here that we define as an operation. It it kind of uh, translates to an actual function, as you can see. Like especially in case of main one, it has the arguments that we uh, provided earlier. It's it's, a sli it's still very basic, but for a showcase, it's good enough. And the value uh, operation uh, operator, I, I'm I'm confused now. Operation, sorry. Uh, translate into the constant operation of STD dialect. So, uh, and then we actually use the same pass infrastructure to uh, lower the STD uh, dialect into LLVM IR. LLVM IR is an IR, is the last dialect that we want to use. This one is directly translates into LLVM IR and makes our lives much easier. We don't have to work with LLVM IR uh, anymore, at least that much. And we can use uh, LI, ME2 LIR actually, as you can see here, let me use my mouse, as you can see here to generate this one into this thing. By the way, uh, here when we ask Serene to uh, emit LIR, it already knows how to uh, lower SLIR to uh, MLIR and then how to lo lower SMLIR to LIR. So it happens automatically. We just by providing the emit step kind of we interrupt the compiler at a certain time and we, we're like, okay, finish up after you generated this LIR for me and don't continue. And the same here, right? So uh, this block of uh, STD dialect directly maps to this block of LLVM dialect. As you can see, like there's a function, then constants, like it's co kind of similar because like the dialect we had was quite, like the code was quite similar, uh, sorry, simple as well. But um, one thing to note here is that as you can see, the func here, the function here, looks like an operation, right? Like the syntax, the general syntax that I explained earlier. This function here, uh, this is like the dialect name and the function looks like an operator, but it's kind of different than the general form. Where is it? Uh, it's different than this form, right? But there's some similarities. So what happens here is that, like, this is a guess and it's like a kind of a possible, not possible, like, I'm all, like 99% sure. <laughs> this LLVM dialect created its own verifier, parser, and printer. So this thing that we see here is actually the result of LLVM dialect's printer. So since you can have your own parser and printer for each operation, then you can actually eliminate all un unnecessary uh, things from your uh, dialect and make it nicer. Like this, this actually looks nice and easy to read, right? So anyway, when we uh, get to this point and generated the LLVM IR, then we can again use the um, pass manager and pass infrastructure to lower the LLVM IR to actual LLVM IR. So we can use the uh, emit IR to actually generate the, the LLVM IR. Um, and the code that you see here, like this piece, this piece here is the result of tra uh, translating and converting the LLVM IR dialect to LLVM IR itself. And we can pass like uh, this thing to the LLVM IR compiler and compile, uh, like compile it to target code and create a native uh, binary out of it as we do in, in a certain compiler. I'm going to talk about it in the future, but for now, as you can see, we have a, like a, a 
how it works i'm going to like we're, we're going to have another episode talking about llvm specific, uh, specifically but for now just as a quick overview it's like saying that we have a, like a malloc function and a free function external to this module uh, like import them you know and then define the main function that returns i64 and uh, returns number three there uh, same thing here uh, with some with function uh, main one three input arguments and some metadata so but when we get here then everything is ready to actually uh, generate the target code but we might again run some passes on the generated LLVM IR as well to do further optimization here as well. Like on each step, we can have some specific passes for that uh, step to optimize uh, the, uh, the different level of, no, IRs in different layers uh, based on the semantics of that layer, right? And finally, when we optimize this piece as well, we can use the pass manager. There's a pass to generate object code out of this one, out of the IR. And finally, by generating the object file, our work is kind of done. Then we use a linker to generate the actual binary. Don't worry, I'm going to talk about uh, all, all of that steps uh, in future videos like I'm going to show you actual code, but we needed the we needed to know the basics of MLIR to be able to actually understand the uh, code that I wrote for um, the, for the entire IR generation. And finally, uh, here is a list of resources that I highly recommend you to actually have a look at. The first two are two uh, presentations by the um, MLIR engineers. They're pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, they're really good, but they're quite short. So one hour is not enough to uh, uh, talk about MLIR. Honestly, like it takes a long time. Uh, I read about MLIR and LLVM almost every day and I feel that there's a lot like, tons of information that I'm missing and I have to read. So the docs of MLIR are your friend. Uh, there's good amount of document, but uh, documents, but there's a lot of documents missing as well. The language reference uh, describes everything I, I talked about today, but in details, it should be your reference for the language, like for the MLIR language itself and some information about uh, the basic block, uh, the block concept in compilers if you need. By the way, I already mentioned in the episode one, there's two books for compiler design. Uh, if you're interested, read. Uh, you have to read those as well, especially the Tiger book is quite short. The Dragon book is uh, longer, but it's kind of the Bible of uh, compiler design. Um, that's it for today, folks. Um, if you look uh, if you like what i do please subscribe to my channel and leave a like and if you have any question please comment uh in the comment section of youtube uh, or reach out to me thank you for sticking around and have a lovely time see you in the next episode